Hey friends and welcome. My name is Dr. Heather Carden and welcome to Ask Dr. Heather. If you are brand new, please put a number one down and I'm going to give you a nice big warm welcome. So I actually created this page several years ago because I had patients coming in um, asking lots and lots of questions or asking about a recipe or asking about a substitution if we had found food allergies or just asking just lifestyle questions, exercise questions. So I thought what an easier way is to do a blog or do a YouTube channel, which I'm still trying to figure out a little bit, or just do a Facebook Live where I can actually share those questions that other people would have. So as people actually send questions in to me here, I actually just pop on and answer lots of questions. So I've been a lot of questions about fasting, as you can imagine. I've been talking about a ketogenic lifestyle, a lifestyle for a very, very long time. I'm gonna say decades. We've been actually practicing alongside my husband for more than two decades, but keto has popped up over the last three to five years. As you know, uh, I live a ketogenic lifestyle to the best I can myself and alongside my husband. I love teaching about ketones, ketosis, and all things about the ketogenic lifestyle, also low-carb lifestyle. I am one of the co-chairs of Low Carb Keto KC, but today we're gonna talk about fasting, get a lot of questions. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Is it just a fad? Is it here to stay or come and go? Should there be our fears about it? Is it safe? Should we do it? Should we not do it? What are, the, um, what are the advantages of it? Is it really therapeutic? Can people use it as part of a therapy or as part of a tool in their toolbox to help them better their overall health? But So I'm going to get those questions answered now. And as you are brand new, again, this is absolutely meant to be shared. Go ahead and hit that share button. Again, I'm coming to you live from Overland Park, Kansas. And a lot of this question comes from, I went to restorative yoga tonight. I'm kicking off my my own fast. I do a faster reboot one time a month at least. I do a 124 hour fast each and every single week. Um, and I do always recommend that you check with your healthcare provider first. And before I could recommend a fast or an extended fast to my patients, I do have them. We check a CMP or a CBC. We make sure they're metabolically sound. Or again, check with your healthcare provider if you have an extended health um, health history that you need to make sure that you're metabolically sound to do this. But one time a week, I do a 24-hour fast. That's generally lunch to lunch, brunch to brunch. I do it on my busiest day because that way it's kind of diverted for me. I get the glucose and glycogen out of my body because we know glucose is toxic for your body. That way it shifts around and I get it out of my body. I'm not possessed by food. I'm not around my house being tempted by things. I do have a lot, uh, probably about 40. I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel, which is Ask Dr. Heather. I'm getting to the questions, but anyway, so I am kicking off my fast tonight. We'll probably break it on Wednesday, just depending on when my body is hungry. But I was at restorative yoga today and there was a gal that I have met and she's been following my story and she just came up to me and said, hey, how are you doing today? And I said, you know, I'm excited because I'm getting ready to kick off my reboot or my fast. So I love doing restorative yoga, especially as I kick that off. I did hot yoga yesterday and hot yoga the day before to really get my sweat on. Um, but I said, you know, I'm having a little bit of problem wearing my prosthesis. So that's why I came to restorative yoga. Calm down my nervous system. Breath is so important as we get ready to go into things like fasting or if you're getting ready to study for a test or getting ready to take a vacation, get that good breath work in as you calm your body down, especially as you're releasing toxins through some sort of a fast or a reboot. So I was just sharing a bit of my story with her, but I thought this is a good time to share this with you. Why fast? We know that we are exposed to toxins each and every day from the blue light on my computer to my phone to toxic words to toxic things in our dryer sheets to things in the environment and oftentimes we are eating 17 to some hours a day and our body can't eliminate that we know our skin is our largest organ and just think about that if you're a person who puts lotion all over your skin or maybe you have dryer sheets and you're, it's so cold in kansas and you have layers upon layers of clothes on and then again you're not letting your body sweat out efficiently or maybe you are in a hot yoga class or sitting in an infrared sauna or you're out running in the weather and it's two or three degrees outside and you have fabric sheets as we all know are toxic and you're sweating that that's actually closing your pores in and no way for that to get outside of your body so that's not a way for your body to really detoxify because again our skin is our largest organ and we want to sweat those things out it's hard in the summertime or hard in the winter time for that to happen if you're in a cold region also we know our our minds or our eyes are exposed to again lots of different lights we breathe in lots of toxic fumes from cars and other things, especially as it gets colder, the waters, the air is more dense. I'm going to slow 
down, you guys. The air is more dense, so also you're exposed to things. So inside your house, outside your house, if you work in a nail salon, if you work in chemical plant, things like that, you're exposed to lots of different toxins. We also need to talk about foods for a minute. You know, I'm a foodie, so if you are too, put your favorite food down below. Um, but also let me know where you're joining from. I always like to know where people are joining us from. But there's more nerves in your gut than your spinal cord. That's why we hear all the time that we have this brain, gut brain balance. So when we say that there's more nerves in your gut than your spinal cord, it's because our gut has so much work to do. When you eat a single piece of food or an entire meal, or you're eating five times a day and then you're chewing on gum in between meals, or you're sipping on a soda or a sweet tea or a coffee latte thing, or again, you're chewing on this gum or you're taking little bites of candy or little bites of nuts or things like that throughout the day, the entire time that you're eating or chewing, you're having to digest food. All of those organs and digestion are having to work. They're having to sift and sort. Is that a food? Is that a carbohydrate? Is that a nutrient? Is that an artificial flavoring, artificial coloring? Is that something that we should be afraid of? Is that a friend or a foe? So they're having to sort that out the entire time during your day. So if you wake up and you're eating and your body's trying to sift and sort out all those food and those nutrients, then it's got to bind it up and say, oh, can I make some calcium and use that for a strong bone? Or can I make some iron out of that? Or do I need that B12 to actually help break down carbohydrates? or do I need to make more insulin? Do I need to make some sterile hormones out of that? Do I need to use some cortisol or did I not sleep good enough last night? Do I need to downregulate the cortisol? So all day long when you're eating food, your digestive system is working all the time. Maybe it's a food allergy that you're ingesting all the time or every other day or maybe every six hours you're ingesting some type of food allergy, food sensitivity, or some type of artificial food, processed food, and your gut is having to work on that really, really hard. And it does actually pre pass over into the brain. Histamine is one of those uh, pathways that is used inside the neural pathways in the brain or the neurotransmitters in the brain, that histamine pathway. That's why we talk a lot about food sensitivities and brain focus and cognition. So when we started putting all those things together, it kind of makes sense that it might be a be good good idea to maybe not eat all day long or maybe take a day of rest that you don't eat. Because just think about that. If you're not eating and processing food all day long or maybe just for one day, what would your body be doing? What would your nervous system be doing? What would your gut be doing? What would your liver be doing? What would your spleen be doing? What would your intestines be doing? I'll tell you what they would be doing. The first 24 hours to 36 hours, they would be getting rid of the glucose and glycogen, which is toxic to your body, just cleaning that all out. Think of it like the gas tank in your car. I am, I'm in my home right now, and my office is literally two miles, and our church is about three and a half miles. Uh, the place we like to shop is about five miles. Our kids' school is um, right in between our house and our office, so let's say 1.5 miles. If I got gas every time I stopped, like I went to the school and I got gas in the car, and I went to the office and got gas in the car, and then I went back to the home and got gas in the car, went back to school and got gas in the car. Mama, four boys, you're always going to school <laughs> and to work and to practice and things like that. Then the gas would start overspilling, right? It's never was going to get empty and actually recycle it. That's what happens every time you're putting food in your mouth when you're not hungry. Like the gas tank is never empty in the car. It's spilling over, spilling over. That's what's happening when you're eating food. You're eating food, your insulin's rising, and then what happens, you're storing sugar, the liver storing sugar, that's where you get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So food, increase in insulin, increase in stored sugar in the liver, and then increase in stored fat in the body and around the liver. So when you don't eat food, think about what happens. No food or in a fasting state, you don't use insulin, which is great because you can save that for longevity or in your later years in life. And then your body can actually break down the stored sugar. That happens the first 24 to 36 hours. And then after that, it can start breaking down stored fat and getting rid of that. And then what happens is your body increases human growth hormone, and then it actually starts making new white blood cells. So now it can focus on your immune system. It can focus on your hormone system. It can focus on regenerating, rebalancing out your cortisol. It can start regulating that blood sugar blood sugar again. So it's a great thing when your body isn't eating all the time. So when you wake up in the morning, you eat. That's what we were told to do in the 80s. I know it. We eat and we process food. And then when you start eating all day long until the moment that you go to bed, then what happens is that the four hours after you eat your last meal, it takes that long for your nervous system to process all the food, calm back down and go to bed. So if you have your last bite, let's say
say at 11 p.m., it is all over, let's add that four o'clock, it's 3 a.m. before your nervous system calms down. And if your alarm goes off at six or seven a.m., you didn't get very much sleep. The average person should get really about eight, seven to eight hours of sleep, that's solid hours of sleep. Then you wake up, you're eating up, eating again, something, your alarm goes off, you're putting food in your mouth at seven or eight in the morning, there goes a whole process again. That's why there's such a big push for intermittent fasting, that seven to eight hours, which is so important. So the first question was, because again, I get hundreds of questions, fasting, many different types of fasting, dry fasting, and I have a lot of videos, I'm going fast because I want to hear your questions, a lot of videos on my YouTube channel, which is Ask Dr. Heather, totally free, just go subscribe, dry fasting is nothing at all, so no food, no water, and dry fasting compared to wet fasting, wet fasting is water only, is a three to one ratio, so if you did three days of wet fasting, which is with water, you get the same effect as one day of dry fasting, so if your doctor said, hey, we're going to do a colonoscopy tomorrow, don't eat or drink anything, you get some of those same results so you've been dry fasting before probably if you're gonna have some surgery our ancestors have been dry fasting if they were actually moving where they were living from one place to another place maybe they were evacuated due to fire or due to predators or maybe they're wet fasting when they were actually out hunting maybe they didn't get a kill today or the next days but you still had to do your day-to-day -day operations I know you guys have heard me talk about that before so many different types of fasting one of the favorite uh, books I like to read which is super easy I suggest to a lot of my patients is actually um, the guide to fasting by dr. Jason Fung I do follow a lot of his work some great um, great research information there a lot of cited research in the back if you want some more clinical research information so the fear that we have is that we've been told to eat because if we don't eat then um, what's gonna happen is that we tap into our stored muscle mass that can be true on a high carbohydrate diet because of myostatin on a ketogenic diet myostatin is actually turned off and your lean muscle is protected so there are some things about that that people get feared on but if you actually break a fast and you go back to eating carbohydrates then there is some fear of losing lean muscle mass conversely on a ketogenic diet when you're on a fast when you're in ketogenesis you're not using insulin your insulin is turned off using just a teeny little bit of it because you're just eating some carbohydrates that you're getting in nuts or seeds or green leafy vegetables things like that then you're using very low levels and your lean muscle is protected so that's why you see a lot of people in third world countries still have a large amount of lean muscle mass, still very strong, very vibrant, very virulent, and they still are having a long longevity, and they still, again, are very strong. So there's not generally a fear of people losing the muscle mass on a ketogenic diet because once you get past that 12, that really that 24 hours, your body goes into ketogenesis where it's burning fat for fuel. Because we just talked about a minute ago, when you're not using insulin, your body starts burning that stored sugar. Once the stored sugar is gone, the gluconeogenesis, then it starts burning stored fat. So is it safe? My answer is yes. It is a fad. No, our ancestors have been doing this for a very long time. We just went back and started looking at the basics. Where did we go wrong? Back in the 1970s when we started using the standard global diet where we're saying eat all these carbohydrates, eat all these processed sugars, eat all these grains. Then we fast forward and looked at where did we go wrong? Where do we see the rise in obesity? Where do we see the rise in all these diseases of lifestyle? Cancer, diabetes, heart disease, where do we see the rise? 1970s when we, in, we implemented that pyramid that we know that is all the grains, all the fruits, all those things, and little bitty fats on top. I'm not gonna name out Ansel Keys as the only one who to blame for all of that. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of things that were done wrong back in the day. So we know that fasting is safe. Um, we know that there's an optimal window that a lot of researchers have pointed out. There's still a lot of re uh, information going on today, but it is safe to do maybe an eight to 10 hour each and every day. I think doing a 24 hour is great to do one time a week. There are a lot of people who do a five two, which means five days a week, they eat anywhere from an eight to 10 hour window and two days a week, maybe one or two days a week, they do a fast that long. But I'm a big component of doing one 24-hour fast a week. Again, safe, check with your doctor first. And then one time a month, doing a 60 to 72-hour fast. I think 60 is pretty safe because you can make sure you check your blood sugar, check your blood pressure. But again, that gives it time to get your human growth hormone. You get all that glucose or that stored sugar out. Then your body starts tapping into that stored fat. It gives you time for your stomach to shrink back down, your taste buds to calm back down if you're craving sugar. Amazing things can happen. Is it a fad? No. Is there fear? 
Absolutely. Sugar is highly, highly addictive. So when you take someone who is a carbohydrate addict, and there's a lot of people out there because two thirds of America is obese and overweight. They got that way, not all because of the pyramid. They got that way because sugar is highly addictive. So there's fear. Anytime you take away sugar, something that someone's addicted to, there's going to be fear. There's going to be mood changes. There's going to be a little bit of panic, but I've never had a patient or a friend or a family member saying, Hey, I'm really mad at you because you made me stop eating sugar. Hey, I'm really mad at you because you have me, you know, close down my eating window. So I can tell you after over 20 some years of practicing, my husband practicing alongside of me over 20 some years, so almost 50 years together combined, 23 to, yeah, almost 50, yeah, I'll do that math for you next time, but we're getting close to 50 years combined practicing that we um, have some people have been nervous. Remember, fear and excitement are the same neurotransmitter in your brain that there is a little bit of nervousness, but then people really get, really get excited about the changes that they get. They start sleeping better. The relationship with food is much better. They figure out that food is energy for their body. Your body is its own pharmacy. When you eat spinach, it's for the B vitamins, it's for the fibers, for the roughage, it's for your body can make iron and things like that. It's good for your bones. People eat protein for the amino acids. You eat healthy fats for the essential fatty acids. When you start learning that you eat food to nourish your body, not because you're angry, not because you're sad, not because your pet died, but you eat food for energy, then you start really appreciating what you're eating. Food has a whole different flavor that takes on when you start looking at your food that way. What are the advantages to fasting? I think I talked about that first, but I'll carry on with that. So what it does is it resets your relationship with food. You start identifying when you're eating or when you're just carb craving and when you're just kind of on autopilot. Well, I eat because it's eight o'clock in the morning. I eat because it's noon somewhere. I eat because everyone else is sitting down. And when you start really writing down and watching when you're eating, and when you're eating just because, oh, I'm at the gas station, I might as well grab something, or the kids are hungry and I gotta drive through because I'm on the way to practice again. Please don't forget, I'm a mom of four boys. <laughs> they are now 17 to 25, but we have been in the thick of thick of things when my husband was coaching three, uh, three different teams. I understand that our organization is key to coming to that and we have been gluten free. Christian will be 22 in March since he was four years old. So we were gluten free before there's any gluten free restaurants, any gluten free drive through. So we were been home cooking a very, very long time. And then you have to have some preparation when that comes down to it. And we've been eating whole real food, not processed food. And I think anybody who knows me, my patients will tell you the same. My friends will actually say, say she's right. She's, she's telling you the truth when she says that is that you know, we talk about advantages coming along that it really does pay off. When you start being mindful of what you're eating, your body will thank you for it. Your body, your bowels will start working better. Your skin will start working better. Your lungs will start working better. Your brain will start working better for you because when you can hit set that reset button, which means what happens is when you overeat and you overeat, your stomach stretches out and stretches out. And then when you're putting food inside your body that it doesn't like, there's one or two things are gonna happen. Either you're just gonna go right through your body because your body doesn't like it and you're gonna get diarrhea, or it's gonna get stuck there because your body's trying to process and break it down and you're gonna get constipation. They call that irritable bowel. Or you're gonna put it in there and the body says, I don't like this, it's gonna come back up. Silence, reflux. GERD. People say, can you talk about GERD? Can you talk about IBS? Can you talk about SIBO? Can you talk about gut inflammation? Can you, okay. We're putting food in our body that it doesn't like, and then we're doing it. The average person eats 17 times a day. If we would actually just let our food digest and rest, amazing things can happen and go back to real whole food. People always ask me, what macros, what's percentage, what should I do? Eat real whole food, watch your body, eat when hungry, stop when full, and then wait till your body's hungry again. Amazing things can happen. So fasting we talked about, is it safe and effective? Yes, I don't think it's a fat, I think it's what our bodies were meant to do. They were designed to fast, they were designed to have a break when eating. I think when we can do that, our whole nervous system will calm down. We see signs in our nervous system being over aroused as being from overfed day after day after day after year after year. Those come in the signs of anxiety, ulcerative colitis, um, irritable bowel. We have lots of tummy issues going on. I'll just say it that way. A lot of tummy issues going on. And then people get fearful of what they can eat, what they can't eat. Again, we have a guts are in a mess.
podcast, every time I turn on my computer, there's a new, uh, a new feed on some doctor saying something about gut issues, but it's true. That's what we need to do. So it's almost better. Should we not eat or should we eat? Eat real whole food and then give your body a rest. The advantages are numerous. I started making a whole big, <laughs> a whole, I made start making a whole sheet here of what the advantages are, and it was so big I didn't even know where to start. So I'm just gonna talk, save that for another one. But we know is that the mind, body, gut balance is so strong, and what's the easiest thing to control? It's the hardest, but the easiest is what you put in here. Because if you can put in food that nourishes your body, then your brain's going to be much happier. With their books called Potatoes Are Like Prozac, we have the the brain grain grain brain book by Dr. Amen talking about you know wheat belly and what grains can do to your brain. All those type of things. Just cut the food out and go back to the basics, and you're going to have some amazing things can happen. Do I think that fasting is a therapy? I get this question all the time. Absolutely, I think it's a great tool to put in your toolbox is that you just have a period where you don't eat. And a period can be anywhere from a few hours to a, a longer time. When you look at the definition of fasting, and this is where people get, get a little bit, little bit, oh, I don't know what that really means, fasting. 12 hours is called a simple fast. So if you simply just don't eat from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., that's a simple fast. So congratulations if you're already doing that. Because so, for so long, even the 80s, they said, you know, there are companies saying, don't eat after 8 p.m. We've all heard that, right? Raise your hand, don't eat after 8 p.m. We've been hearing that for decades. Um, a cycle fast is don't eat every 16 hours. You're just cycling through your food. A strong fast would be, you know, not going 16 to 18 hours without eating. Um, a warrior fast would mean 19 to 21 hours. And then a one day fast is a full 24 hours. So you'll hear the word OMED, O-M-E-D, which is one meal every day, which is what I'm doing if I'm doing a day to day fast. So if I eat, you know, if I eat at four o'clock today, I would wait till four or five o'clock tomorrow. And that's just one day a week. That's just because I want to give myself digestive rest, a nice way to detox. So I hope I gave you guys some bones and some nuggets. I will actually be sharing my journey throughout the day because I am doing a keto reboot. I do it with a company, Prove It. And um, I, it, when the 60 hour bell dings, that doesn't mean I just dive in and eat. I wait for my body to tell me it's hungry. Um, and I actually had a beautiful meal after church today with Brussels sprouts and chicken and then I went to restorative yoga so I thought my time had started there and I was listening to coach Rob and then I came home and my mom is here with us and my son and my husband were eating I'm like nope I'm gonna go ahead and start my time a little bit earlier and then I took two bites off their plate so my time did not start at two o'clock my time started at 6.30 because I took two bites off their plate. It just happens that fast. So I understand how autopilot works. It just happened to me. But I want to share my journey because it's all about here. It's about knowing I'm giving my body an amazing gift um, of what I'm going to do to let it rest and reset. I have a very busy week coming up. And I think this is what my body needs is to let the insides of my nervous system rest because the rest of my week is so busy. Oftentimes people are like, it's not a good week. This isn't a good week. And sometimes there's not good week. Um, sometimes I think people ask me right before a cycle for women, and I've heard a lot of this from Dr. Dan Pompa, is that you know women crave things right before their cycle because their body are needing a little bit more carbohydrates right before their cycle. Why do you crave dark chocolate? Well, it's zinc that your body's needing. So right before a cycle, I don't think that's all, um, oftentimes the right time for women to actually do a fast or if you're going to do an uh, extended fast right before their cycle. But for some women, it works. Most women, it doesn't because they're craving more because their body's needing more because they're getting ready to do something because oftentimes if you were getting implantation that's when you'd be having a baby and you definitely don't want to restrict your calories that's why your body's doing that even if you're post having children that age so I generally tell women you know once you start your cycle on day one or day two that might be a great time to do a little bit of detoxing or a little bit of fasting but it's different for each and every one that question I've probably had a few hundred times so when to when to throw that in here um, the other questions I'm getting a lot of questions on libido and hormones I did a hormone talk a few weeks ago about natural hormone therapy after the natural age of menopause and I also talked about andropause for men so I will hit that again towards the end of the week and also we're going to talk about fibromyalgia because 1.8 million people um, 
are actually diagnosed with fibromyalgia so we are going to talk a little bit more about fibromyalgia I already have a YouTube video on that but I'm going to answer that again or talk about that again just some free things that you can do to help yourself if you suffer from just widespread skeletal muscular pain it doesn't have to be fibromyalgia it can just be chronic pain osteoarthritis so that's kind of what's coming up this week hope you guys have an amazing week if there's something that you want to hear about from Ask Dr. Heather drop it down below I get um three or four hundred kind of messages a week and so that's generally how I want to put things together definitely want to talk a little bit more about fasting and be and again we're going to follow up with a beyond fasting after this we're getting ready to kick off an eight week program we're going to give you some nuggets here about what's happening over the eight week program but today it's about fasting we're kicking it off so I want to say cheers to you guys have an amazing evening and if you have not started your attitude gratitude journal which means to get a piece of paper down write down what's happening here in your brain before you go to bed you only have to put down two things amazing things can happen because we know that when you actually put positive things in your brain before you go to bed there's little things that BDNF which is brain derived neurotrophic factor you don't have to remember that but it's like miracle grow when you put that inside your brain it calms your brain down amazing things can happen little synapses start hooking together and actually make happy little things happen inside your brain even though your past may have not been rosy like a rose garden we know that those can be like again a little little miracle grow inside your brain to make tomorrow a better day so you guys have a great day thanks for amazing questions and again i will check back here in a couple hours and uh see if there's more questions i can help you guys answer have a blessed day